When people think about runtime polymorphism in C++, they usually think about virtual functions and pointer or reference semantics. But in modern C++, we seem to embrace value semantics more and more for its efficiency and clarity. So a natural question comes up. What do we do if we want that runtime flexibility without giving up the power of value semantics? And well, as you might have already guessed, there's actually a couple of modern elegant solutions for exactly that. And today we'll talk about one of them, standard variant. When we talked about static polymorphism, we learned how to use templates to be able to work with objects of different types that all conform to some common interface. Think of various image classes that all have a save method, and a function save image, taking a template or a concept from C++20 on that we assume to have a save method. We can run this code and it outputs what we expect. But this pattern is not very useful if we want to decide which format an image has at runtime. All the code with all the concrete types needs to be visible to the compiler while at compile time. Furthermore, it would be awesome to be able to store a bunch of different images into, say, a vector, potentially populating this vector at runtime, and save them all using their common save method. But our images have different types, so we can't put them into a single vector in a naive way. Aha, I hear you say, we seem to be talking about textbook dynamic polymorphism, and we already know how to deal with that from our previous lectures. We can create an interface class, and in our vector store pointers to objects of classes deriving from this interface, and process all of them in a for loop without regard to their actual type. The output of this code is exactly the same as before, but now the selection of which implementation is used happens at runtime. Is it polymorphism? Yes. Is it dynamic? Yes, again. But we did have to give up certain things. Now our image classes inherit from a common rigid interface class. This dependency will be hard to change down the line if it turns out to have been a bad design decision. And as I mentioned countless times before, it is very hard to predict the future. We're also forced to embrace reference and pointer semantics rather than value semantics, meaning that our classes are now designed to be accessed by a pointer to them, and we cannot easily copy or move the actual objects around thus the use of non-copyable base class. For a refresher on this, please refer to our lecture about inheritance. Another potential issue with having to allocate pointers rather than concrete objects is that it usually means that we have to allocate them on the heap. Typically this is not a big issue, but can become one if we need to allocate many objects in a performance-critical context, as they can land in different areas of our memory, and finding a good place for them takes some potentially non-negligible time. Watch a video where we talk about memory for a more in-depth look into this topic. This is where standard variant comes to the rescue. It allows us to keep using templates just like we originally wanted, but adds a twist. We can store a variant of our types in a vector and use standard visit to call our save image on any type from the ones that we allow in our variant. Note how we create the vector in exactly the way that we dreamed about before. We also call the same save image function just like we did when using virtual functions and pointers. However, it is hard not to notice that there is a bit more syntax present here. There is a new standard variant class as well as the new standard visit entity being used, and we have never seen those before. So let's look into them now. The class standard variant is a so-called type safe union type, introduced in C17. A variable of such a variant type holds one value out of a defined set of types. Intuitively, we can imagine standard variant as a box type, in which we can store objects of some selected set of types. The values in the variant occupy the same memory, which means that the amount of memory allocated for the whole variant object needs to be enough to store an object of the biggest type, plus some memory to store an index of which value is actually stored. As our box needs to be big enough to hold a banana type, if we put an apple into it, some space will be left unused. Or, in terms of code, if a variable's type is standard variant int std string double, it means that this variable can hold either an int, standard string, or a double value. Do note, though, that a variant is not permitted to hold references, arrays, or the type void. Also, while variant can technically be configured with the same type more than once, I rarely see the need to do this, as these variants are much harder to work with. But if we look long enough at our box analogy, a logical question pops up. Can the box be empty? In other words, can we have an empty standard variant? 
Those who were paying attention to the example code we've just looked at could notice a comment that, by default, variants store a value of the first type. So it would seem that creating an empty box would be problematic. But if we think more about this, always creating a variable of the first type to populate standard variant might not be desirable or indeed even possible. Imagine that we store types that do not have a default constructor in the first place. This means that this code won't compile, throwing an error that tells us that a constructor of a variant is ignored because it does not satisfy the requirement standard is default constructable. To mitigate such situations, there is a type standard monostate. This is an empty type that is default constructable and we can use it as the first type in the list of types that we pass into standard variant, if we want our variant to be in an empty state by default. Now, with all of that out of the way, let us talk about how we can store some value in standard variant object. If we don't have repeating types in our variant, we can set our variant variable's value by simply assigning it a value of any of our selected types. For all the other cases, I'd point you to in-place method of the variant class, but we won't talk about it here. Once we stored some values in a variant object, we usually want to get them out somehow. The simplest method for getting a value would be to just get it by using either the type name or an index of that type. Again, here we mostly focus on getting the value by type. Do note, though, that once we put one type into the variant, getting another type will throw a standard bad access variant exception. If we don't want to use exceptions, we can use standard holds alternative to check if the variant holds the correct type before getting it. But this tiny example might feel quite limited. Think about it. We need to provide the type of our variable in order to get its value at the call site which means that we somehow have to know at compile time which type our standard variant holds to use it, which almost feels like it defeats the purpose of using the variant type in the first place. But remember, in our motivating example, there was this function standard visit that we could use to magically access the stored object, regardless of its type. Here, standard visit applies a function object to the value contained in the variant. Should our variant hold a string, the operator that accepts a string is called, and should it hold an integer, the operator that accepts an integer is called instead. And while we used an explicit function object for illustration here, we could as well use a lambda function, of course. Note how in this example we use auto for a type of our value in a lambda. This auto will become different types depending on which type is actually stored in a variant, and the whole example works here because standard cout is able to accept any of the types we use here. If we would store a type that standard cout does not work with, like standard monostate, the situation would look a bit different. In such a case, we can use a neat trick to allow specifying all the different overloads for different types at the call site. By creating a template struct, often called overloaded, that accepts multiple classes, each with an operator round brackets, like a function call, we can instantiate an object of this struct by passing in as many function objects, or lambdas, as we need. This lets us easily create a local visitor right where we need it, taking full advantage of the flexibility that lambdas offer while having explicit overloads for types that demand it. Note how here too, we can use auto to catch any types that we don't want to handle explicitly, but if we do decide to handle them explicitly, those implementations are preferred. All in all, our overloaded struct can take anything that has a call operator. So as a tiny exercise, try to use the above overloaded struct with the printer function object we created in the previous example. Would that work? Post a link to godball.org with your answer in the comments below this video. And while you're there, please take a moment and answer a simple question for me. How useful are my videos to you? If they are useful, please tell me what they helped you achieve in the comments and maybe even consider supporting this channel if they brought you something tangible. If these videos fall short of their goal of being helpful though, please tell me what I can improve. I spent quite some time on these videos and it would be such a waste not to keep improving them just because of the lack of feedback. Regardless of the choices you made, I thank you sincerely for your time. And now back to standard visit. The fact that standard visit can select the correct function from a variant seems almost magical. But as always, it is nothing but a clever implementation. The exact details of how standard visit is implemented are probably beyond the scope of today's lecture, but we can quote cppreference.com to get the gist of how the appropriate function is selected when standard visit is called. Implementations usually generate a table equivalent to a possibly multidimensional array of function pointers for every specialization of standard visit. 
which is similar to the implementation of virtual functions. On typical implementations, the time complexity of the invocation of the callable can be considered equal to that of access to an element in a possibly multidimensional array or execution of a switch statement. That is to say, selecting the right function is usually pretty fast, but still takes some tiny amount of time at runtime. But the main message I wanted to convey here is that this selection does happen at runtime. And that means what? It means that we did implement dynamic polymorphism that still lets us use value semantics and even built-in types, and typically works pretty fast. However, the whole conversation about standard visit would be incomplete without talking about one important pitfall of standard visit that I see many beginners struggle with, and we'll have to do some digging to understand all the reasons behind it. You see, we need to ensure that all the types in a variant are covered in the function object we provide into the standard visit. Otherwise, the code won't compile. This might seem confusing at the beginning. Why do we have to cover cases that we never aim to use? However, the reason why it was designed this way becomes easier to see if we look at a slightly more complex example. Imagine for a moment that we have a class foo that holds some standard variant member variable and a function print. Let's say the declaration of this class lives in a foo.hpp file. We implement its print function in a corresponding foo.cpp file. And because we want to print the value stored in the standard variant, we use the standard visit with, say, bad printer function object passed to it. We call it bad because this particular printer class does not handle all of the types that we can store in our variant. If we try to compile this code, we won't succeed with an error that says something along the lines of not being able to find a matching function to call to invoke bad printer const string reference. This happens because the compiler wants us to cover all of the types of our variant in the bad printer class. To understand why the compiler insists on it, let us for a moment assume that it would be allowed to compile this code into a library without covering all the variant types in the provided function object. In that case, there would be no way for the standard visit compiled into this library's binary file to handle the missing standard string type, as the binary code for this would have never been generated. But there is nothing that forbids someone to write an executable and link it to our library, right? There is also nothing that forbids them to store a standard string in the variant and call print on our foo object. The behavior of this code would be undefined, as our library's binary file would have no idea about how to print a string stored in the variant of the foo class object. To the degree of my understanding, this is the reason why the standard requires a function object passed into standard visit to be able to handle all the types that can be stored inside of a given standard variant object. And now we know everything that we need to know to return to our original example. It is now clear that declaring image to be a variant allows us to store either a PNG image or a JPEG image in the vector of images. At the same time, the use of standard visit with a tiny lambda allows us to call save on any concrete image class object thus achieving dynamic polymorphism, all while keeping our value semantics intact. So I hope I could get you convinced that standard variant is extremely important for modern C++. If we embrace value semantics and implement our code largely using templates or concepts and need to enable dynamic polymorphism based on some values provided at runtime, standard variant, along with standard visit, offer a pretty good way to do that. For whatever reason, these tools are still not considered first-class citizens when C++ is taught in schools and universities, which is a bit of a shame. I hope that after this lecture, you'll be able to embrace the power that these tools provide and be better informed about the options we have when in need of implementing dynamic polymorphism in modern C++ while maintaining value semantics. And on this note, I want to thank you for watching until the end. It really seems to have a big impact on how many people end up seeing this video and, well, on my motivation for continuing doing this work. And if you feel like you would benefit from a refresher on the topic of dynamic polymorphism as viewed through the prism of inheritance, then please watch this video of mine. While if you'd rather refresh your understanding of how we allocate memory in C++, then go ahead and watch this video about stack, heap, smart pointers, and overall on memory management in C++ instead. Thanks a lot, and see you in the next one. Bye.